You're beautiful, he says. He wants to take a picture of me. But I'm getting sick, and my shoes are killing me, and I'm sweating in my long sleeves. I figured the track marks wouldn't turn out all that brilliant in living color. He's not into color, he says. I can roll up my sleeves. So how do I look in black and white, I says. Do you like what you see? Lip seal. He wants a profile. Tells me to turn my head one way, then the other. What's my good side, I say. The inside, he says to me. Somebody said to me once, they said, Lincoln, these photographs, these heroines photographs are so depressing. And I said to them, it'd be way more depressing if I didn't take them. Okay, let's go. So let's go do our stuff. How's your foot feeling? Like kicking you in the ass, that's how it's oh. feeling. Why? Why would you want to do that? Okay, so let's get up here to this fabulous location, right here. Right here, Megan, just kind of like that. It's kind of in, the, in front of this door. Just kind of right about there. Yeah, that's good. What do you think? It's a good location. You don't want to know what I think. I guess I do love myself to some degree because I wouldn't be alive if I didn't. When it comes right down to it, I can't not love myself, but in day-to-day -day living, I'm completely self-destructive and do everything I can to hurt myself. I've always depended on a man, whether it be a boyfriend to take care of me or a man to pay me for sex. A lot of the men that come see me aren't fucked up men. They're men that have life completely together. They have wives, they have families, they have well-to-do jobs, they're driving brand new cars, they own their homes. They're throwing away $100 just for fun. You're not gonna sell me drugs. You don't sell me okay. drugs. I'm gonna be forced to kill you. I don't want to do that because I like you. You know, every time I see Megan, I'm so glad to see her, that she's still alive and that she's still walking. She's limping. My son died of crib death in March of 95. And from that point, I began drinking heavily and got addicted to prescription pills. My whole survival is through working the streets, my food, my cigarettes, my drugs, my clothing, my everything. Have you been hurt by men? Have you been raped? I've been raped, yes. But what hurts worse is the way they look at you afterwards when they refuse to pay, as if you're the one dirty habit they can't break. I remember her when she first got to town. She was such a freckled, young kid, teenager, young upstart. She had um, such hope. And then every time I saw her, every month, Every day, every year, she just goes down and down and down a notch. I'd really like to see her get what she wants. What everybody, everybody says. Do you want to get off drugs? There's the answer, boom. Get off drugs. There you go, life's okay. You know, you haven't been raped, you haven't been beat, you haven't been through hell, no. It's okay, now you're off drugs. Life will go back to normal. That's not the case, you know? You know how many people get off drugs and they end up killing themselves a month later because they just cannot take it? 
or they get off drugs and then they end up going back and they end up dying because they overdose because they don't have the same tolerance but they just can't handle society. Society doesn't change when you stop doing drugs. You are always the junkie. It doesn't go away when the cocaine goes away or when the heroin goes away. You know, the track marks might go away but the junkie's there forever. It's just the way it is. camera lesson. Have any questions? You know who to ask. I think heroin down there okay, is the big about, scapegoat uh, right for the right neighborhood. Here. They think that heroin and cocaine is the big evil in the downtown east side. Well, it is in a way, but I think that people like Megan and numerous other women what they need more than anything else is love. They just need some real unconditional love. And, and then if they had that, heroin wouldn't be in such big, hot pursuit, big demand. to think about the relationship between the two of us and then think about how sad it really is that that's, that's the only person I have to depend on to care about me, you know? It's just not fair, it's not right. I mean, Lincoln has a daughter, Lincoln has lots of people in his life and does he really have time for somebody who needs to be cared about to feel sorry for me? So I guess it kind of hurts to be cared about, too. Heroin is like a warm blanket. Heroin is a, a lover that is always there for them. It's somebody that they can believe in, somebody that they can be close to, somebody they can hold, and it's, it's not even anybody. It's a little bit of powder. It helps to numb, that's all. It helps to numb all the other pieces that are too much to deal with. Um, and it's something to live for. It's something that's there for you no matter what. It doesn't let you down. It doesn't betray you. It always makes you feel good. It never, never makes you feel bad unless you don't have it. Oh, I'm loyal to the heroin. <laughs> a photograph is a secret about a secret, he says. The more it tells you, the less you see. So, what does this picture say about me? I'm not a bad person. I'm not a bad person. I'm not a bad person. I'm a drug addict. This is Iggy Pop, man, look it. Yeah, let's give her a microphone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> she does. I think she kind of looks like Iggy Pop. Well, she was my assistant on this day, actually, that I took this picture. You make a much better assistant. Thanks, Lincoln. <laughs> Here's Tiff, Tiffany. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, this is the photograph that started the whole, th the whole series. Okay. I was just waltzing through the downtown east side, photographing um, some buildings, and, and I met the woman on the left, and then she introduced me to her two friends. When I got the photographs developed, um, it really shook me up in the darkroom. I remember developing it, just being really moved by it. 
thinking that it was, uh, it was something really different than the stuff that I usually shoot. And everybody that saw that photograph really got choked because of uh, the emotion. I first started shooting the Heroines Project in 1997. I haven't really been counting the, the women that I've been photographing. I think there's probably somewhere over 300. I just haven't had time to count them to do a head count. But I'm putting more on there every week that goes by. I seem to be shooting, keep shooting. I can't seem to stop because there's just so many new faces down there every time I turn around. Yeah, that's she looks photo. so sad. Yeah, these scans are bang on. I'm impressed. And you can see this guy here laying on the mattress. Oh my god, I didn't and, even um, see that. <laughs> that was from that other shot of the transvestite standing beside the oh, guy with yeah. the master, uh, mattress. And this is the woman Ren that Renee. was putting on the lipstick standing yeah. beside the smith right. And this woman here is Lucy in the oh background. Oh my god. She's doing her crossword puzzle. You can see her there. I didn't realize that. And that was this crack dealer who was selling crack to these three gals. Yeah, make sure you send that photo to your mom. Yeah, for sure. Because yeah. it's not going to last long now. in your back pocket. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's true too. That's true. Yeah, it'll be lost in minutes. All these girls, they're pretty. They have the heroine look. You can see them thinking, the hustle's on. How am I going to get my fix down? When am I going to come up with $10 or even 9 In these pictures, I can tell you every last one of them is thinking the same thing. Where am I going to get my next fix? I have to get straightened out here. And after that's out of the way, I can get started on my day. It's a war zone down there. It's completely um, surreal. It's like watching a movie, a movie with drama, action, romance, um, horror, sex, panoramic sound. It's, it's so colorful, it's so vibrant that I can't help but notice it. That's nice, that's the best. <laughs> So, Bernadette, if you could stand right about here. Let me just do a meter reading. That's about it, right there. Right about, uh, just right there, that's good. 25th, set F8. Mm -hmm. Are you feeling as good as you look? I don't know. I think so. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay, I just stand just this way a bit. Yeah, right there, that's good. Bernadette is a real fashion play on the downtown east side. I mean, her uh, wardrobe is constantly changing, and her costumes and her look and her disguises. She's one of the, the best dressed women in Vancouver, and she does it on a, on a, on a no budget, not on a low budget. I'm an independent businesswoman. I have my, my as we would call, regulars. I've always enjoyed sex, I would say. I'm a very sexual person. Um, years ago, it was much different how it was the, the uh, picking up the client and actually going through with it as compared to nowadays. Um, all, most of the people are into doing dope so much now that it's like, you know, as soon as they do the first fix, the first toke, that's it. They're just dope, 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 dope. And mental game, games towards the dope.
pimp is cocaine. That's my pimp. I swore a man would never make a bitch off my, pardon my saying, my pussy. <laughs> so, I know man, but my pimp is my cocaine. I was abused mentally and verbally from my mother. My father, abuse was from him because he was everything. He was my life, I loved my father. And uh, how he told me that how two people love each other is by making love to each other. And we'd get up early to go and feed the ducks because we had a bird farm. And we'd go to the barn where everybody else is still sleeping and do the chores and all that, and we'd be off in the barn together. And I loved my father, so what we did was never wrong until I was 18, when I found out what had actually happened was not right. So what I did with my father wasn't wrong. So that's really hard to deal with when you find out. Basically, it was like, why should I give it out and not get paid for it? If they're gonna take it from me, then you might pay for it. I might get some sort of satisfaction from it, you know, or something from it, because they are, and I'm not. If I'm gonna feel this cheap, at least I might get something at least to make me feel better, you know? But after that, you know, it's the, the rapes and uh, the beatings and uh, the boyfriends and the beatings and the rapes and, you know, that's what it's the use of drugs is for. It helps make you forget because you're having to grind for it all the time. So if you're thinking about dope, you don't have to think about anything else. When you see people drive by and you look at them in their car and you're standing in the street, everyone's looking for a tragedy to look at. It's almost like people slow down to look at car accident on the highway. They're looking out the window and they're looking at all these tragedies and they can't do anything about it because they have their agenda and it doesn't include the people of the downtown east side. They're just spectators watching and looking and criticizing. I really like this photograph a lot. She looks like a card shark. Like this picture, this picture almost looks like it was taken in the 50s or the 60s or the 70s. It's really hard to date. I think, it's, uh, I think she's gonna really like this picture. Turning this light on. Here it comes. The only thing I ever wanted was to be held. It's what we all want. Is that asking too much? Come here, baby girl, he says to me, like he wants to help me find a part of me that is missing. Love's hard to find when you're 14 and your mother's baby dolls with red hearts all over them and your father's pushing downwards on the back of your head. Rape happens when you work on the street. You know you deserve better and you're waiting for it. You mean to live. You mean it. Hurt me, baby girl, he says. Use your fists. If the kids didn't get abused at home, then they wouldn't be running away from home, and then they wouldn't be getting it mixed up with the wrong guy that gets them hooked under the drugs and so on and so forth. There's always the starting point of it all. Where it ends, nobody knows. Usually in death. The runway, the alleyway, it's all the same. Sex, drugs, money, the same. It's got the same look, the same hook, the same old same. For a while after I quit selling my body, I felt like I was living on borrowed time, and anything I couldn't borrow, I would steal. Anything to get high, to stay high. I wanted to eat this mother up, suck every last bit of marrow from the bone of life. When I started this photographic series, I was completely fashioned out. I, I'd worked shooting stuff for magazines and 
photographing famous people and beautiful people and beautiful places and getting paid to make people look handsome. With the heroine's photographs, it's just so raw. And those women are so beautiful, but they don't have all the, the fancy accoutrements like the hairstylists and the makeup artists and the fashion and the clothes and the beautiful locations and the textured um, lifestyle of being cool and hip and beautiful and all that. They have absolutely nothing. And the way I photograph one of these women in the downtown east side is exactly the same way I would photograph Sarah McLaughlin or Deborah Harry or Vivian Westwood. I mean, I treat these women exactly the same. Do you want to put your juice over here? Sure. There's a sense of connection there between the subject and the photographer and the women really enjoy that they enjoy being paid attention to okay yeah right there Chantel that's good I'm trying to make an image of them that is honest that's true that's it's a document of their lives it's a portrait yeah just like that it's good I actually had a career and and also you know routine, you know, tax-paying jobs. <laughs> I was um, designing clothes and working with some friends at the stores, doing mock designing of their stuff. And uh, also I did contemporary animation. In my early to mid-teens, I had tried working in the streets, uh, just out of curiosity. I guess sort of like psychologically trying to define the difference between, you know, love and sex. And it was more curiosity and like a game to me then. But I found myself sort of falling back to that because I knew that it's guaranteed money. Heroin came late for me because uh, I sort of submerged into the old quote-unquote punk rock scene. You know, like um, you do heroin, you just like submerge into numbness, not physical numbness, but you know, you don't have to deal with the problems or consequences that someone might be suffering because of your decision. I played this game with myself. I would do it for a couple of days and then I wouldn't do it. It caught up with me. You know, after about three to six months, you know, started feeling dragged out. The sick had gotten so extreme that, you know, you feel like you have bugs in your bones and, you know, you feel like you have a knife constantly in the bottom of your back. Literally, you feel like your stomach is physically sucked in. You know, almost as if it's like being raised up into your rib cage. You can't eat anything, you can't not eat. You can't sleep, you can't not sleep. <laughs> Your senses are so heightened. It, it's, it's so considerably annoying that you ignore it and it becomes, it, your senses become oblivious. Just stick this Yeah, yes, I still got it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's it, that's the, <laughs> that's the shot. My worst bad date was, um, was unfortunately a bad date that a lot of girls experienced uh, in this neighborhood. So his pattern was pick up a girl, get her high, create um, sort of a paranoia conflict psychologically with her so that there was stigma and, and a debate so he could take a step into um, control, enslavement, you know, and uh, he out would come a roll of duct tape. The whole time I never stop looking him in the eye. He wants me to cry or beg, but I won't give him the satisfaction. I just fix onto his eyes, all the time working to get my hands free. Duct tape is like everything, it's got a lifespan. He rapes me, sticks a gun down my throat and sodomizes me, but nothing he does gets a rise out of me. Not until he burns me, flicking matches onto my skin where they stick and I smell my own flesh burning do I break. I sweat. I start to shake, and then a tear I can't stop slips down my face. Just one, that's all it takes. He knows I'm his. He's given me a taste. Am I ready to eat? I tell him, if I'm hungry, I'll eat. There's nothing that doesn't belong to me.
Usually when you see pictures of heroin addicts or prostitutes, they're ashamed to be who they are. But with these women, I'm not ashamed of who they are. I don't want them to be ashamed of who they are. They're who they are. They're doing what they're doing. They don't have to be doing it forever. They're doing it in this time in their life. And I want them to look at the camera. I want them to have that contact and to say, yes, that's me. And it's like they're coming up for air. It's, it's almost like they're confronting the viewer, like, yeah, it's me, here I am. The group shot of the 14 women was done on Mother's Day. When you hear of 14 women killed in a massacre, and then when you see an image of 14 women, that really makes you realize what 14 women look like. If I had a choice, I wouldn't be a heroin addict. I'd get up each day and do something different. I'd be a mother to my daughter, that would be enough for me. I'd want my daughter to speak her feelings, say them out loud. I'd teach her to cry, but only if she wanted to. Heroin doesn't let you do that. It hurts for you. It thinks for you. It lives for you. It fucks for you. It has no passion except for you. It has no God but you. I wanted to be a mom. I wanted a family. I said I'd never be a heroin addict. I'd never do it. I said I would never stick needles in my arms. And I said I'd never be a prostitute. Yeah. So I know I'm a excited. spot. I know a spot right around the corner. Okay. And it should be there. Okay. There, right around the corner. There's the corner. There's right the spot. Here. Okay. Where do I swing So come on over here. Okay. Oh boy. So I think that uh, I think Wendy, if you just sort of like stand stand right here, maybe All just right. put your foot up like that. Hold it. Okay. Okay. Let me just pop another roll in here. You took one picture, Lincoln. <laughs> no, I took two. There was only two on that roll. Can you pass me a roll, please? Yeah, I'll take that. So that looked good, Wendy. Thank nice you. Nice location. Right into the bottom lens here, Wendy. Right there. Yeah, that's it. Right when there. you're so abused and neglected and abandoned and, and no one's there to talk about it or explain it or ask you how you feel about it and let you express your feelings, they stay inside. So you're left being a little girl on the inside and an adult on the outside and being thrown into the world to just... supposed to know what to do. And it's just, um... It's just not fair. I chose the easy way out, though, instead of biting the bullet and just going through it and asking for help. I just stuffed it down and got high and hoped that it would go away. And it doesn't go away. It doesn't. I still feel the same way I felt when I was five years old, inside. That's scary. I just wish it could have been different for me and my daughter. That would have made all the difference for me. My daughter is everything in the world to me. And it looks like I love drugs more than I love her. But that's not the way it is. That's where the power of addiction comes in. Because I wanted nothing more than to be a good mom. I was. What do they think about you, the people who pass you on the street? They see the druggie, the whore, the junkie. I like them to see me as their daughter, a sister, a lover, their mother. 
They see needles, spoons, condoms, think HIV, AIDS. I want them to think how hard I try to live. There's more history per block in the downtown east side than anywhere else in this town. I mean, it's where all the red light district was and the opium dens. This is where all the loggers and the workers came to live and to party. It's really rich in history, but it's been completely ravaged and stained and soiled and trashed and neglected. What I like to do is photograph the environment because the environment is changing. The buildings are being torn down, everything's being fixed or renovated somehow, and the past is being slowly swept away in the rubble, and the women are slowly disappearing. A lot of these women become missing or they overdose or else they get murdered or stabbed. I mean, these are the missing women. These are the ones that are, that are, that are disappearing. This is her and her sister. And Sheila's missing. She always got to me because she's just so, so charming. I did that really, that bothers me more than anything, having her missing. I'm so worried about the same thing happening to Megan. She never even made it to 20 years old, Sheila. The difference between nothing and zero, that's the difference my life makes, he'd say to me each time I left the house. What do I like about heroin? The rush, the ringing. You're in your own little world where nothing can satisfy your hunger for more. I've seen a lot of people end up in the downtown east side that used to be happening and with it and on top of it. And chin up a little bit. Having a happening life and next thing you know they're in the downtown east side and they're sticking a rig in their neck. Completely down and out. Okay, that's good. Hold it right there. Chinatown is just uh, going through like no. this metamorphosis right now. They can't right take it. They can't and take Chinatown away. Well, they'll renovate it and fix it all up and clean it up and change it so much that it won't even look like the old Chinatown that it is now. So yeah. it's really great to document that, that look. And like you're changing too. I mean, you're not gonna look like this forever. Yeah. Chinatown's not gonna look like this forever. So it's like really important to photograph things that are in change. Well, most of the people in downtown East Side are from somewhere else and they've come to Vancouver with an idea of this is a beautiful city and a beautiful place and they, they try and they have these ideas that they want to get that they've always wanted and that just didn't pan out for them. Okay, come forward a little bit. Yeah, yeah, right there, that's good. Chanel is really perky. Chanel is so upbeat. She always has a mission. She's going about 99 miles an hour to where she's going. No roots, no friends, nothing. Got off the plane in jailhouse clothes. I have started going back dancing. I had a little room at the Marble Arch. You know, you, could, you couldn't tell I was an addict at that point. And I met this guy down here and I fell in love and uh, he introduced me to heroin. And then um, cocaine, heroin, cocaine, heroin. We went from living in an all right hotel to being homeless and living in the park. Like when people say, why don't you get a job? Why don't you work for a living? It's like being a junkie, is, it's a full-time job, you know? The stress, the hustle, who can I 
con next? Where am I going to get my fix? I call it go duck hunting. Like when I go looking for some guy or whatever, looking for a mark. You know what screwed me up sexually is I was raped when I was young. But it wasn't a vicious rape. Like, I don't know how to explain this. Like the guy, like no is no, right? But this guy was like, I'm doing this because I love you and like petting my forehead and being, and if anything, that just grossed me out after that, like in my relationships. If somebody would like touch me and hold me and something, I'd think that they were mauling me. I hate sex. If I could zip them up in a whole condom, I would, like their whole entire body. I promise him I'll do anything if that's what he wants to hear. But mostly under all that promising, I'm not really there. I'm a kid again, diving down deep to retrieve a coin of any description. The man always let us keep what we came up with. I was the best because I could stay under the longest, coming up for air only because I had to. I promised myself the good life. I had earned it. The locations are really important. I wouldn't want to photograph these women in front of a, a backdrop. The, where they are is where they are in their life and where they are in the city. I've been to all the different types of foster homes most of my life. Around about 27 of them, so. I grew up very young, so no childhood, so I'm trying to enjoy my childhood now. <laughs> so, uh, I took on adult responsibilities about the age of five, like running the farm and doing mechanics on the weekends for my dad. He, does, he was a trucker. <laughs> Sexual abuse, it started when I was four and a half, until I was about 13. So. He used to pay me for having sex and all that with him, so. I felt like I was a working girl all my life, so. Um, I was, uh, there were times I told him I didn't want to do it, so he would kill one of my favorite animals and tell me I'm next if I didn't perform, so I had to. He had entered me that time and I was bled all over the place and I guess some bled all over the bed and whatnot. And, Threw me in the bathtub and then again forced sex with me in the tub and a lot and then beat me and then told me to clean up the mess. So I just don't like taking baths. <laughs> they throw me like 20 or 50 bucks every time. And it was quite frequently. And I would put a bunch of money and roll up the wool around it, with about maybe no more than less about a thousand dollars in each ball. I had rolled up over the years the, the money they had paid me for having sex. And when I finally told uh, my counselor at school what was going on, they moved us out of the home and I just left the money there. There was dirty money, I just wanted no part of it. In my experience of growing up, my foster brother, my foster dad didn't uh, touch him or any, anything like that to him. And I thought posing myself as a boy, I wouldn't be being touched like that by a man. All the way through elementary school, I told everybody and anybody that I was a boy and dressed like a boy and acted like a boy. So it was different. It's like, kind of like a double life. <laughs> Nobody would hurt me being a boy. And um, yeah, this is a good this is a good spot. Okay, right there. Don't move, Josie. Right there. That's good. Beautiful. Hang on, let me do another one. That was so nice. This one will be even better. We were taught to show no emotions. If I uh, cried, we got beating more until I was taught not to cry at all. So, uh, As it came for affection, I wanted a hug. They'd shove me away and stuff. So was... I love animals. <laughs> the only thing about cats is unconditional love. So, I think that's about the greatest love a person can have is with their animals. It's a unconditional, a faithful. They never hurt you. I wish people could be like that. <laughs> It'd be awesome. It'd be a better world. 
Now when I'm pulling a date, I'm not really there. I'm doing what I wanted to do when I was growing up. I wanted to be an animal trainer, to train animals to run and keep running forever, like some wild part of me no one can ever touch. Okay, right there, hold it. Hang on, you'll just stay there. Put your foot back the way it was. What I'm doing is I'm forcing people to look at these photographs, to look at these women, to look at the plight. That was real nice. That was just the best shot. To look into the eyes, to really see these women, to not just see them as, um, as a junkie or a whore or somebody that's riffraff on the street, but to look into their eyes and to see them as who they are, to see them as a woman, a child that's grown up somebody's mother, somebody's sister. Lonely eyes, hungry eyes, vacant eyes. Lying eyes, crying eyes, flirting eyes. Bedroom eyes, faraway eyes, dark eyes. You don't just say, oh, I want to be an addict. I want to sell my body, and I want to put needles in my arm. Yeah, that's what I want for my life. Fuck this getting a job and having a family and having a car. No, I just want to be a drug addict with no place to live. That's just not reality. They're, they're down here because you're, you're hurting, like severely hurting. You know, you're not in your right mind to be down here doing this. You cannot be completely sane living on the street putting your life in jeopardy hour after hour, not day after day. Every fix is a roll of the dice. Every time you get in a car to do a date, it's a roll of the dice. Every time, you know, you can't be sane to do that. You just can't. Hollow eyes, hurting blue eyes, fucky brown eyes, yellow eyes, Cat's eyes, black eyes, black and blue eyes, baby blue eyes, startled eyes, leave me alone eyes, sad night eyes. I've had people tell me that, you know, I'm strong, I'm a survivor. 25 years, here I am still. I don't know if it's called strength or stupidity. <laughs> I'm tired, I'm very, I'm tired of being strong. I'm tired of giving myself down here. When you're out here, you're either blinding yourself to reason or consequence or anything sensical. I'm not looking for good sex, and I'm not looking for someone that I can have sex with respectfully even. You know, I'm... I'm sort of terminally looking for love, you know, so I can give it. Eyes caught in the headlights of a speeding car, fumbling with a zipper eyes, round eyes, keep your eyes to yourself, keep your eyes open, the whites of your eyes, eyes for no one but you. He could be their sister or their daughter, their niece. It could be. I mean, there's all walks of life down here. They all used to have, all of us used to have some kind of a normal life, jobs, family. Everybody has somebody that loves them. You know? This is sad. The fun's over, the party's over. The first year was great, you know. Oh, this is fun, it's like Woodstock, you know, we're sleeping in the park, living like gypsies. But it's getting really old now. And it's taken its toll, like, I'm starting to look like a drug addict now.
Lean and Hastings. It's like pain and wastings. Like you go all over the city, it's beautiful, it's shining. And you get down on this corner, and there's like this big dark cloud hanging over top of the corner. Use your eyes, open your eyes, close your eyes. An eye for an eye, they rape us with their eyes in the wink of an eye. It's okay to hug, it's okay to show your emotions, you know. It's, uh, and we all cry and bleed the same. Um, it's because uh, somebody wants to cry it doesn't mean they're a rump. It's to show them they're hurt. And after a good cry, it makes you feel a lot better too. So, you know, if you can cry, go for it. You know, definitely do it. It's a good feeling afterwards. It's a tremendous weight off your shoulders. You know? Like I say, if I could, I would. <laughs> Smiling eyes, distant eyes, blind eyes, heroin honeymoon eyes, dope sick eyes. How little our eyes let us see.